So, okay. Uh, now it's the final talk for today, and the final talk of our event is Professor John Houghton. Welcome. So, let me a brief introduction. If I can find. Okay. So, welcome, Professor Orton. So, Professor Orton is a professor at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne and professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. Uh, he made a number of con important contributions to metaphysics and epistemology. His works include narrow content, the reference book, Relativism and Monadic Truth, Metaphysical Essays. So, please welcome Professor John Orton. Thank you. C could I just ask, so the, the, I, I know there's an hour allotted. Um, am I, ha how much of the hour am I supposed to speak for and how much of the hour is discussion or is that up to me or how does it work? Okay, uh, as is your last talk, it's up to you, but uh, uh, the idea is uh, 40, 45 minutes for your talk and at least 15 minutes or more for... Okay, so I won't go over, I won't go over 40, I'll, I'll aim at 40 minutes and then, uh, yeah. But, so I've um, uh, been, I'm working on a book with, uh, with two people, uh, Aaron Wall, who's a particle physicist in Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge in England, and uh, uh, Joab Isaacs, who's uh, um, an epistemologist specializing in formal epistemology at uh, Baylor University in, in Texas. Uh, we're writing a book on uh, fine tuning in particle physics. Um, uh, the, there are various aims of the book. One is to pe get people up to speed with the essential elements of the physics, and Aaron's doing that. And uh, another is to look at the topic quite rigorously through the lens of Bayesian epistemology. And Yoav and I have assigned ourselves the task of doing that. Uh, I'm not going to be doing very much Bayesian epistemology today or very much physics. In fact, I can't do the physics. Uh, when it comes to physics, you and I know a little bit about what we're talking about, but not very much. Um, so I'm going to give you talk in a very informal way about the topic and hit, hit on a few points that don't require anything very precise either by uh, when it comes but with respect to the physics or with uh, respect to Bayesian epistemology and sort of try and convey a few ideas as best I can. Uh, can everyone hear me? It's coming through okay, is that right? Uh, uh, yes. So. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, good. Um, a tiny bit about the physics, which I'm then going to sort of simplify away from. The, the, the fine tuning argument that uh, has got most airplay, as it were, is a fine tuning argument from the cosmological constant. Uh, there's this parameter in physics, in the standard model of physics called the cosmological constant, where that is sort of encodes the energy density of the vacuum or the energy density of empty space-time. And uh, Einstein included the cosmological constant in his original equations for general relativity in his efforts to construct a model of a static universe. Then Hubble uh, basically uh, noticed some stuff about distant galaxies that made it clear that the universe isn't static those galaxies are receding from us and so that the universe is expanding. And that led Einstein to, took, to take the cosmological constant out of the, uh, uh, his favorite equations. But then it was later discovered that not just that the universe was expanding, but the rate of expan expansion was increasing uh, with time. And, and that was quite striking. Uh, you wouldn't explain, uh, basically, just given gravitational forces, you would not be uh, expecting the rate of expansion to increase with time. And so 
what physicists then started doing is reintroducing the cosmological constant because that would explain, as it were, an anti-gravity effect. It would explain why, despite the gravitational forces between, uh, between material objects, the rate of expansion from the, of the universe is increasing. So we're back to having the cosmological constant again. There are these techniques, very well-established techniques in, uh, in particle physics for, uh, for estimating how big certain uh, values on certain parameters should be. These techniques fall under the rough and ready heading of dimensional analysis. I'm not gonna go into dimensional analysis here and I'm not really confident to, 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 in a way that Aaron is anyway. The, the basic thing to know is these are techniques that are super well established and they applied these techniques to dimensional analysis of tech, dimensional analysis of forming expectations about the size of the cosmological constant. And they were way off. It's very striking, caused something, it's caused something of a crisis in physics in a way, just how badly these established techniques, how badly these established techniques do by way of estimating forming expectations about the size of the cosmological constant. It turns out it's way, 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 way uh, smaller than you'd expect in some technical sense of expect given by dimensional analysis. And it also turns out that if it was anything like what you'd expect, uh, galaxies would not form and life is, is impossible. So the universe in a certain way turns out to be much more hospitable to life than you'd expect given the general framework of the model that includes the cosmological constant. And there's a similar kind of failure of expectation on, uh, on one or two other constants and notably the, the uh, so-called Higgs mass. Okay, so that, that's, that's the general striking thing that's causing something of a, of a crisis or consternation within physics, just how badly this, these well-established techniques of dimensional analysis did with respect to uh, forming expectations about um, the cosmological constant. I'm basically not going to pursue the details of actual physics, but I want to uh, sort of get, help, help you feel your way into the sort of the conundrum and the challenge by way of thinking about something that's easier to think about. In, in, a, in a way, it's something a bit more like the fine tuning of, of initial conditions. And it's, it's sort of a bit of a just so sorry, just to give you a sort of framework for thinking about things in a way that I think will be helpful. Let's start with something that we know from statistical mechanics. Suppose I introduce a gas into the corner of a room. What we learn from statistical mechanics is this macro description doesn't guarantee that the gas will spread to the, uh, doesn't guarantee it will spread throughout the room, but basically um, uh, it will, statistical mechanics tells us it's almost guaranteed to spread. And what that means is that among the different combinations of microstates spelling out the exact positions of the gas molecules. Only a tiny proportion of them uh, leave the gas in the corner. As it were, you've got to put them just so, so they bounce together in just the right way so that they stay in the corner. Only a tiny proportion of them uh, um, keep the gas in situ, as it were, and nearly all of them result in the gas spreading. So I'm using this ideology of a tiny proportion of the micro configurations, as it were, and talking that way involves putting what's called a measure on micro configurations that provides a way of comparing relative sizes of various sets of micro configurations. Say, so, oh, the size, if you look at the set of micro configurations that um, uh, keep the thing in the corner, and look at the set of micro configurations that have the gas spreading out to fill the room, the one's tiny with regard to the other. 
it's not quite a counting thing because there's so many micro configurations there might be infinitely many on either side but measure gives these measures these these measures that you'll get from from the physics give you a sense a, a notion of relative size and if you use that kind of measure as a guide to your confidences then when you hear gas has been introduced to the corner of a room, you'll be extremely confident that it will spread. Basically, your confidence, you get your confidence if you're thinking through the lens of uh, statistical mechanics by calibrating your confidences to these, as it were, physically respectable measures. So I want to introduce you to a character that I'll call the one universe atheist. The, uh, the, sorry, the vanilla one universe atheist. I've got a few terms there, vanilla, atheist, and one universe. The, I'll go through those in turn. Athe atheist, pretty, pretty darn confident that um, there's no God. My vanilla one universe atheist isn't certain that there's no divine artificer, but is pretty confident uh, that metaphysically speaking, it's all something along the lines of atoms in the void or fields over a, a space time. Uh, it's kind of got a reductionistic attitude to the metaphysics uh, where things bottom out at the fundamental level it, it, with atoms or space time points that have certain fundamental field values and relations and properties of the sort that some idealized physics would uh, hope to uncover. That's the vision. That's the, uh, that's the sort of the metaphysical vision. One universe, they think there's just one universe. They're not multiverse people. They're not thinking, oh, there's tons and tons of universes. There's not like a, a, a pluriverse of universes. There's just one universe. So that's the one universe part. And now the vanilla part. The vanilla part is this kind of atheist and and this kind of atheist is it really is the kind of atheist that's often described in the fine-tuning literature is that they use uh they use standard physically respectable measures as a guide to their confidences so when they uh they see gas introduced into the corner of a room in a way that the, when, the, when the statistical mechanic says only a tiny proportion of the microstates uh, keep it there, they'll be highly confident that the gas will spread when they hear that macro description. There are other kinds of atheists apart from, even other kinds of one universe atheists apart from the vanilla one universe atheist. I mean, let me introduce you to another kind of character that's quite alien to, to this literature, who's a Kantian optimist. The Kantian optimist, as far as the metaphysics goes, uh, it's not really Kant because Kant had a god and so on. So my Kantian optimist atheist, as far as the metaphysics goes, has the same kind of vision as the vanilla atheist, but they don't calibrate their credences to the physically respectable measures. I mean, just to get a feel for what a Kantian optimist might, might be like, the, the Kantian optimist atheist might see the Israelites running away from the Egyptians and finding their way to the Red Sea, and then there's a sea in the way. And then the Kantian optimist, I mean, this is sort of a bit of a parody, but you'll get the picture. The Kantian optimist atheist might think, well, the physically respectable measures tell me that there's much more of them uh, the, the, the only a tiny proportion of configurations of the of the sea are going to lead it to part so that the uh, Israelites can run away. But I give much more confidence to the world going well to, than that suggested by the physically respectable measures. Statistical mechanics has certain um, uh, micro configurations uh, that are that that would lead the red sea to part and i've got this primordial confidence that uh things are going to go well so i'm not going to use the physics to, as a guide to my confidence that's a kind of atheist but to most people in this literature uh that kind of atheist is weird and unreasonable where they've got nothing metaphysically to go by but the sort of uh, an atoms in the void kind of picture but nevertheless refuse to use the physically respectable measures as a guide to their confidences. So we've got this character, the, 
vanilla one universe atheist. And the whole idea of fine tuning is that the uh, existence of fine tuned life, the existence of life that's very surprising by the normal ways of forming expectations using physically respectable measures puts a lot of pressure on uh, the one universe vanilla atheist. It's an embarrassment to the one universe vanilla atheist and puts a lot of uh, epistemological pressure on such an atheist scampering to a different worldview. Um, by, again, by way of a sort of a thought experiment, imagine you are uh, a one universe vanilla atheist that was a ghostly observer of the early history of the universe. And suppose there was a scenario in the early history of the universe that was structurally analogous to a gas being introduced into the corner of a room. And suppose you knew as a ghostly observer that there's only going to be one gas. There's only going to be life if the gas stays in the corner. It's sort of a, you know, a, a bit of a, uh, it's just an analogy, but suppose you knew that. If you use the standard techniques of forming expectations given by your physics, you'd be almost positive that the gas would spread, so you'd be almost positive that there weren't, uh, there wouldn't be life. Suppose you then see the gas stay in the corner and then life emerges. It's hard to just take that in your stride. It'd be a bit like seeing the Red Sea part and then say, well, you know, there are some micro configurations that uh, allow the Red Sea to part, so I can just take that in one stride. That is a very hard thing to do. It's so surprising uh, by the lights of the, the standard uh, measures that, uh, that you'd be a little embarrassed to just stay as a vanilla one universe atheist. Another sort of uh, uh, an analogy, I mean, um, you know, suppose you were going out in the garden in the morning uh, you expect the configuration of leaves to have been settled by the wind. And suppose you go out there, you went out there one morning and saw various verses of the Gospel of Luke spelled out in Greek by the leaves. Suppose that happened. Now, there's a thing that you could do to react to that, which is to say, Oh, well, that's interesting. That's really wild. The, 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 lead, the, the wind did something really weird last night. It just so happened that it uh, blew the leaves around in such a way that they ended up spelling out various verses of the Gospel of Luke spelled out in Greek. But, you know, it'd be, you'd look completely bizarre to just stick with the hypothesis that the leaves, uh, the leaf configuration had been settled by the wind when you observed that leaf configuration. And it's kind of pretty clear why that, uh, that configure, even though you started off being much more confident that the leaf configuration would have been the product of the wind rather than some artificer who organized the leaves. Uh, it doesn't have to be a non-human one. It's only an analogy. When you see uh, that configuration, uh, you should be thinking to yourself, boy, well, that, um, that is way, way less surprising conditional on an artificer organizing the leaves than conditional on the wind blowing the leaves around by happenstance. And so even though you started out assigning quite low confidence to the hypothesis that the an, an artificer was uh, producing the leaf configuration. Once you see the leaf configuration taking that form, uh, you should um, uh, shift your confidences in the direction of, uh, heavily in the direction of uh, the artificer hypothesis. And Bayesian epistemology is basically a way of making those kind of transitions sort of vivid and precise and the mechanics of those transitions vivid and precise, but it's sort of intuitive enough already. By analogy with the leaf thing, the idea is, hey, 
when you see the gas staying in the corner of, in the, seeing something analogous to the gas staying in the corner of the room at, in the prehistory of the, in the early history of the universe as a ghostly observer, even if you started off putting most of your confidence in, um, in one universe vanilla atheism, your confidence should be shifting to something else since uh, that, uh, that fact is much less surprising, conditional on some alternative worldviews than it is on uh, one universe vanilla atheism. Okay, that's the basic mechanics of the fine tuning argument. Now, I talked about ghostly observers who, first of all, they see the room set up as it were, they see the gas, uh, then they see the gas staying, and then they see uh, life happening. Uh, because remember, the whole idea was the gas had to stay in the corner in order for, 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 for life to happen later. We learn things in a different order. We first learn that there's life. And um, then we learned that uh, there was something akin to the gas staying in the corner of the room that was needed for life. So we learn things in a different order to the ghostly observer. But the idea, again, something that, um, uh, that uh, Bayesian uh, epistemology can make somewhat precise, the order of the evidence doesn't really matter. If you learned it in the one in, in, in one sequence as a ghostly observer, or you learn it uh, in a different sequence as a human observer, still, once you get that package of evidence that gives you a uh, uh, gas in the corner of the room uh, kind of life, uh, you should be uh, you should be shifting your credence markedly away from uh, your confidence is markedly away from one universe vanilla atheist. Okay, I hope that gives you a feel for how uh, the, um, this quite striking and interesting um, argument against sort of reductionistic one universe atheism goes. Um, I wanna just do a little bit of ground clearing. Um, one thing that bears emphasis is that the way that the argument works is that um, is that the short fine-tuned life, this phenomenon of life uh, that required gas to stay in the corner of the room, this phenomenon of fine-tuned life, the key thing is it's much less surprising on certain worldviews than on uh, single universe atheism. That's the key comparative thing. It's much less surprising on one of the worldviews than the other. That doesn't mean it's to be expected on uh, the other worldviews. Suppose, for example, that we're comparing theism and one universe atheism. It's not important at all that, um, that, uh, that fine-tuned life is what you'd expect given theism. No, it might be, you kind of expect uh, God not to make life turn on, um, uh, to turn on a gas in the corner of the room phenomenon. Maybe you wouldn't expect that. That's not important to the argument. What's important to the argument is that it's much less surprising comparatively. Maybe it's, as it were, just to sort of put crude numbers on it, maybe it was, uh, one in a million, you'd, you'd think that was one in a million from my point of view, conditional on theism. But if it was one in a million to the power of a million, uh, given the other worldview, then, then you get dramatic confirmation of theism. It's the, those comparative uh, expectations that matter. Not, not, uh, what is not crucially important is that this is what you'd expect given, given theism. So that's something to be just, just again, going back to one of my analogies, if when we have the verses of uh, the verses of the New Testament in Greek confirming the hypothesis that an artificer organized the leaves rather than the, the wind, it wasn't important that oh, 
I would expect, given an artificer was organizing the leaves, that there'd be these verses of Luke and Grit. No, you wouldn't expect that. I mean, there are all sorts of, they, you might not particularly expect a literary configuration and even conditional on a literary configuration. You wouldn't expect this particular choice. So it's not like it's what you'd expect at all. It might be very surprising even, can, even on the supposition of an artificer. But the, the crucial thing is it's a lot less surprising than it is on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the hypothesis that uh, the happenstance of the wind is responsible for the, for the leaf configuration. So I think that's a very important um, uh, thing to understand. Um, next thing uh, I want to... Um, just, I really just want to get a few more points uh, very clearly in view. Sometimes you'll find people thinking, well, okay, there's, uh, it's wrong to think that fine-tuned life, gas, <laughs> which I'm kind of getting at via the sort of the image of gas in the corner of the room, uh, driven life, uh, it's wrong to think that that gives a boost to theism because there are other alternatives to one universe atheism. And the notably uh, one alternative is the multiverse hypothesis. Uh, the multiverse hypothesis is a vision where uh, there are myriad universes. Uh, and then the, 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 the thought is, hey, given a multiverse, it's not so surprising that there's gas that stays in the corner of the room because uh, in a, if you've got a big enough multiverse, then everything's going to happen somewhere in the multiverse. So that proposition that somewhere in reality, um, uh, gas stayed in the corner of a room in the early history of a universe is not at all surprising given the multiverse hypothesis. That's the, the fundamental idea that drives the multiverse hypothesis. And what's interesting is that uh, a number of very serious physicists have been so impressed, so impressed by the, uh, the, the and, and in effect so concerned by the, um, the failures of dimensional analysis when, when it comes to the, uh, the cosmological constant, that they've been driven to take very seriously a multiverse picture of cosmological reality. And of course, a multiverse picture could be a multiverse atheism. I mean, it doesn't have to be a multiverse atheism, but that's a live alternative. What I said was it's kind of starting to look a little bit embarrassing for single universe vanilla atheism. Uh, but, you know, we could be, as it were, a multi, multiverse vanilla atheist where we kind of use physically respectable measures to calibrate our expectations. And we might think, oh, it's not that surprising that there's gas in the corner, uh, gas stays in the corner of the room in the beginning of, of a universe because with a big enough multiverse, you kind of expect that. I have no qualms with the multiverse hypothesis for the purpose of this talk. All I want to alert you to, it's a bad thought if you say, oh, because there's this other, other hypothesis uh, uh, that's uh, not, not that, 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 that doesn't get into trouble uh, with fine-tuned life observations, then it's wrong to think that these observations boost theism. Just let's, just as a very, very simple model. I mean, suppose you started off a third confident that there's theism, a third confident in one universe atheism, and a third confident in multiverse atheism. So just as a, as a sort of simple model. Suppose you basically, um, these observations led you to be almost zero on one universe atheism. Well, what would happen? Basically, uh, your 
your third comfort, your third confidence in one universe atheism would, would collapse to roughly zero, and the other two would expand. The natural way of thinking about it is that they both get a boost. The multiverse hypothesis gets a boost, theism gets a boost, which ends up winning kind of has to do with, well, what your, what your, um, what your sense of the relative plausibilities are uh, at, at, at the beginning. I mean, maybe you were, uh, you gave a lot more credence to theism over multiverse atheism, or you gave more credence to multiverse atheism over theism. Either way, theism gets a boost uh, when, uh, by fine tuning, uh, for, 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 for all we've said. Uh, it's just the, the actual relative the relative confidence between multiverse uh, atheism and theism will depend on the details of your initial sensibilities, so to speak. And again, um, Bayesian epistemology gives nice ways of making all those thoughts very precise. So if you read somewhere that, oh, fine tuning doesn't give a boost to atheism because of the multiverse thing, then you should be thinking that the, whoever's writing that isn't thinking properly. One last thought, I don't want to get too many, uh, um, too, too many thoughts in play. Well, no, actually, too, there's just two more little things I want to go to. I said that uh, uh, gas in the corner life um, gives a boost um, to um, theism. But we have to be careful um, about what kind of theistic design hypotheses it gives a boost to. It might be natural to think the thing that it gives a real boost to is a kind of theistic design hypothesis according to which, uh, as it were, there's a God who really cares about life and really cares about conscious life or something like that. But uh, it might not break, it, it doesn't, uh, that's not the only thing that it gives a boost to. Uh, it gives a boost to, for example, the hypothesis that God doesn't care about life, but God really loves galaxies, solar systems, thinks they're really cool and beautiful, uh, and really cares uh, about having uh, nice, elegant, beautiful, in a, in a sense that I'm leaving as a placeholder, galaxies. I mean, there's nothing in the fine tuning argument that sort of tells you, oh, God cares about uh, life rather than galaxies or cares about galaxies rather than life. Uh, it's going to give both of those design hypotheses a boost. It will give the life loving God a boost. It will give the galaxies loving God a boost. And where you end up about the relative plausibility of those design hypotheses is going to depend not on the details of the fine tuning probably because it's not going to have probably won't have a telltale thing that militates in favor of one rather than the other but will probably depend instead on your sensibilities about which kind of theistic design hypothesis is most plausible again something that we can make somewhat precise in in a in, in a bayesian setting of course if you kind of uh if you've been brought up in a typical uh, sort of Christian family, you'll probably your sensibilities might uh, gravitate in the life direction rather than the galaxy loving direction. But it's important to understand what the argument does and doesn't achieve. And it does not achieve some uh, boost for a distinct, for a boost of a life loving God hypothesis as a, as a, and not other. Uh, um, design hypotheses, various versions of um, uh, various kinds of divine artifices will all get a boost, uh, just like um, uh, the multiverse and theism both get a boost. And that's, I think, an important thing to understand. One can't expect too much out of uh, the design argument for, for a few reasons then, if your vision of the universe is one where 
uh, suppose you're, you're, you're doing sort of theistic apologetics and you've got a vision of uh, the universe as created by a divine artificer that really cared about conscious, loving, living uh, beings and so on. You're not going to get out of um, the... If you, you're going to have to work pretty hard just to uh, get dramatic confirmation of that hypothesis all o over all others. Out of the uh, out of the facts of uh, gas in the corner life, because um, there'll be the multiverse hypothesis that will also get a boost, and various other divine artificer hypotheses will also get a boost, and uh, the physics won't tell you, might not tell you automatically how to adjudicate between the plausibilities of those uh, various kinds of worldviews that get boosted. One last thing, some, you may read somewhere that uh, fine tuning arguments involve a kind of uh, fallacious anthropic reasoning. Uh, the, the diagnosis goes somewhat like this. Um, well, putative evidence, the putative evidence against one universe atheism is the observation that we exist. But the observation that we exist, the, the, the argument goes, can't be evidence for anything because if we didn't exist, we couldn't observe we don't, can't exist. And if you can't observe that something doesn't obtain, then observing that it does obtain is evidentially not. That's the key thought. If you can't observe that something doesn't obtain, then observing that it does obtain is evidentially not. That's just a bad thought. This, there's no fallacy involved. That is a bad thought that if we can't observe that something doesn't obtain, then observing that it does obtain is evidentially uh, no. I mean, that, that is, uh, it's perfectly respectable to use uh, something that does obtain as evidence for something, even if, um, um, uh, you, you couldn't observe that it didn't obtain. I mean, suppose, for example, you learn uh, that uh, an assassin was paid to try and kill you yesterday. You think, hey, well, I'm here. So the assassin, that's awesome evidence that the assassin failed. Uh, of course, if the assassin succeeded, I wouldn't be around. Uh, to, 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 to observe that I don't exist, but so what? The fact that I do exist is awesome evidence that the assassin failed. There's nothing fallacious about using my own existence as awesome evidence that the assassin failed. So the kind of reasoning that the anthropic, these, these anthropic uh, diagnoses uh, say is fallacious aren't fallacious at all. There's a second problem with that kind of diagnosis that they getting it wrong how the argument goes. The evidence for fine tuning isn't the observation that we exist. The evidence, the, 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 well, the, the, the evidence that drives the fine tuning argument isn't the mere observation we exist. It's the observation that we exist in combination with something that amounts to a gas in the corner of the room uh, development of physics. So it's not the mere fact of life, if you want, it's the fact of fine-tuned life. So the, in some, this kind of uh, sort of pushback um, misidentifies what the relevant evidence is and also uses a principle about what is and isn't uh, legitimate evidence that is, is indefensible. So there is no fallacious anthropic reasoning that drives the fine-tuning argument. It's a very interesting, very powerful argument. It's causing incredible consternation among an, a number of the world's best physicists. So that's a bit of a telltale sign that we shouldn't be too relaxed uh, about, uh, about these uh, fine-tuning phenomena. And there seems to be uh, a pretty good case to be made that uh, these observations from physics have indeed given a boost both to um, multiverse atheism and also to, um, 
to uh, to theism uh, and have put a lot of uh, intellectual epistemological pressure on the standard kind of atheism, which I've characterized as vanilla uh, one universe atheism. Okay, well, that is 39 minutes, so I'm going to stop. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Professor Otter. Amazing talk. So, uh, we have already questions. So, Agnaldo. Thank you, Professor Halton, for your talk. It's hard stuff, but very well, very clearly put. Um, my question is about the multiverse uh, hypothesis. Is, is it um, a metaphysical one, or uh, is, uh, is there any empirical or mathematical evidence in favor of it? Okay. So I, I think if you bore my talk, you should be thinking, oh, well, there is evidence for it, but it's not the kind of evidence that you maybe would have expected. It's not like you look out through a special, special super Hubble telescope and see, see other universes. It's not that kind of evidence, not empirical evidence that involves direct observation, but nevertheless, According to the kind of multiverse lover I have in mind, they say, yes, we've got evidence that's given us a big boost. And what is it? Uh, fine tuning. Fi this, this fine tuning is evidence of a multiverse. So it's something to really get used to. And, uh, but it is a thing that is really driving a lot of very serious, it's not like some wacky philosophers. These are very serious theoretical physicists who are thinking the fact, in effect, they're thinking the fact of fine tuning provides uh, excellent evidence for a multiverse because it would just be too surprising for there to be life if there was a thing. So you can kind of make it precise again in a, in a, in a, in a Bayesian setting, but they are thinking there's evidence, but it's not, as it were, direct observational evidence. It's much more roundabout than that. So from a philosophical point of view, it's uh, as metaphysical as theism, isn't it? It's as, what's, what's that? It's as what? Yes, I mean, yeah, in a way, maybe that's a good observation. In a way, all these worldviews, they go in very grand ways beyond uh, anything we could even hope to directly observe. I mean, one's going a very grand way in, in multiplying more of the same, but still it's multiplication beyond anything that we could kind of even see with the best telescopes and microscopes and this and that. So they've got grand, grand embellishments of reality on both sides. I think that's your point, is the theist has this kind of grandiose uh, embellishment of reality with a divine immaterial artificer. And the, uh, the multiverse person has a different kind of um, uh, grandiose embellishment of reality that goes beyond what can be directly observed, even with sort of telescope enhanced senses. But um, uh, yeah, and, and it looks like the, the thrust of fine tuning, the fi these fine tuning arguments is that we're driven to some kind of grandiose embellishment to sort of keep things epistemologically stable as it were. I mean maybe I was Thank just you. trying to restate your what I thought was your thought in my in my own words. If I got you wrong then sorry. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So we have another question from Professor Greco. John Hi, John. Good to see you. Great talk. Um, I always, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know much at all about the fine tuning argument. Um, but I did enough to think, wow, that's a really cool argument. But now you've made it seem even cooler uh, than I thought it was. So, um, so uh, sort of picking up on the second question, and I don't know if you want to take this as a serious question or not. If you think that it 
is, you know, something that can be addressed seriously, then please do. Uh, but, you know, I was caught by your phrase that, you know, at one point you said things seem to be getting a little embarrassing for the vanilla one universe atheist. And, and I thought, well, it seems pretty embarrassing for any kind of atheist if, you know, they have to switch over to a multi-universe view to keep their atheism. I and mean, that seems kind of embarrassing, too. I mean, is that um, something that you want to address from a Bayesian uh, perspective with this, you know, notion of what's uh, how to understand embarrassment here? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess it might be, I mean, like, um, you know, I mean, embarrassing, I mean, that has certain emotional connotations. Mm -hmm. but let's suppose there was a Bayesian super baby that, you know, they, they had all their pride, you know, and they put all most of their confidence in one universe atheism. And then they found this. I mean, it's not always embarrassing to find out, oh, I was confident of this and then it didn't break that way. You just revise, right. you might in a, you know, sometimes it's delightful to, to, uh, to, to, to find things out. So it, it might not feel embarrassing, uh, I mean, yeah. that's going to depend on the sort of psychological, emotional profile. If they start off giving a little bit of credence to a multiverse, a little bit of credence to theism, and most of their credence to one universe atheism, by the time they're done, the two things that they give a little bit of credence to um, um, uh, will blow up in terms of their confidences. And the thing they gave most yeah. of their credence to will yeah. shrink down. Whether that is accompanied by feelings of embarrassment will depend on human aspects of the thing. If they've gone mouthing off about single universe atheism and belittling people who were uh, like uh, open to the multiverse and atheism, then they might feel a bit embarrassed. If they weren't mouthing off in that way, say, well, just the way it looks right now, but you know, and then, then they think, hey, well, I've got this new evidence. It's awesome. Now I've, uh, I can decide, I've, I've shifted my confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, if right, you well, call how, how, at home and then you get a, you get a, a, a video feed from the, from the, from the um, Yankees game that clearly shows them there. I mean, you're not exactly embarrassed. I mean, you were 95% confident they were home. You got the video feed and it all shifted to, oh, they're at the yeah. Yankees game. That needn't be embarrassment. If you'd gone around mouthing off and saying, there's no way they'd be at the Yankees game, you idiot, then, then you might start to feel a bit embarrassed. <laughs> but, as it were, the embarrassment will come with the window dressing rather than the hard, cold calculations of the yeah. Bayesian update. Yeah, well, but, but how, about, how about if you just consider sort of what this person has has done with their prior probabilities. And maybe this is maybe this is where I'm misunderstanding the physics or something like that. But I mean it seems to me uninformed. Uninformed, it seems to me that the prior probability or the prior confidence that you would have put in a multiverse, and it's not just like there's a few of them. There's gonna be like tons. Yeah. Tons. Infinite, tons. Right, tons. right. Number, right? The, the prior uh, the prior probability of that would seem to me have been infinitesimal. And now it seems like, well, now I'm going to give it a big prior probability. I'm going to give it a big probability now because that's the only way I can hand I can hold on to my atheism. You know, that's what seems a little. I think I can say something that, to that. Uh, I think your sensibilities are before we before we start doing the experiments. I think your sensibilities uh, are that the plausibility of theism is vastly greater than super multiverse atheism, yeah? I, th right, I think that's right. the sensibility that's you're evincing. Down to, right, right. That's what it's coming down to. Forget the post-observation credences. Mm -hmm. The key thing is the pre-observation sensibilities in terms of the relative plausibility of theism and grandiose multiverse atheism mm -hmm. if and yeah. if one has your sensibilities that one is like insane compared to the other in a way that right. favors theism then right. you, you will give it give the one a boost but it's it's as it were the prior will be so low compared to theism if they're a guy like you if the super baby is like you and is giving a tiny tiny prior in in grandiose multiverse atheism in comparison to theism 
then it will get a boost, but it might go from one in a billion to the power of a billion to, you know, one yeah. in a billion or something, right. and then nearly all the credence will go. So that's the key question in terms of sensibilities. And what I didn't want to do is to get into foundational questions about priors, but I think, I think yeah. we're on the yeah. same page in terms of uh, where the action is. So. Okay, thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Do you have any other question or you can see uh, oh no, it's John. Any other question? Yeah, if nobody wants to ask a question, if, Nicola, if no one has, wants to ask a question, I'll just ask another question. Please. Okay, John, so again, apologize. I just don't know much about these arguments, but at one point you said that, you know, the argument doesn't give more, uh, shouldn't give more credence to uh, a God, a, a life-loving God than a galaxy-loving God. Well, so, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's like you, you can't, I, I, I just want to clarify, that there's nothing in the physics that tells you that. I mean, your sensibilities well, about the relative merits of various versions of physics. Oh, this, yeah, this is about physics. This is a question about the physics. So again, I don't know. I, the, the, the way that, um, and I don't know the physics at all, but the way that sometimes the fine tuning argument has been portrayed to me is that it was more, it, they, it, it was trading on uh, more focused stuff about the possibility of life. So even once you've got a galaxy, even even though you've got a galaxy, there's going to be more fine tuning stuff at, on top of that in order to get the conditions for life. So I was just wondering, you know, is is, is your understanding that that's correct, or is, is that just a misunderstanding uh, of the physics? I, I, I probably should have been a bit more cagey. My my, my vague and first thing I want to say, one thing that we're trying we want to do in this and Aaron's doing more of it is there are a lot of bad fine tuning arguments out there mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that look like they've got the same shape but just fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that we want to do is not just be like oh it's fine tuning <laughs> every, every fine tuning argument is awesome actually yeah. a lot of them are no good. Okay my good. Impression, my impression is that the, that the most rock solid ones uh, are not very discriminating, as it were, about the uh, the uh, the galaxy loving God versus the the, the life loving God, and a lot of the ones that try to really tease, try to use physics to tease those apart in a very serious way, are a lot more dodgy. But that's a bit of a promissory note because that's stuff that Aaron's writing, and I'm kind of guessing where it's going, and I'll. I'll follow, you know, follow, follow things where they lead. But I, I think I think you may have got the slightly wrong impression. But it's certainly n not exactly your fault because I think some of the literature is giving that impression. And I'd, that's one thing I'd like to get to the bottom of, as it were, as far as the state of contemporary physics goes. Uh, but uh, I'll be I'll need a lot of hand holding to. Uh, but I, I think it's a good exercise to be exposing bad fine tuning arguments and not overstating what, what, what they show when they, when they, when people in the literature are relying on bad ones rather than good ones. But that's, that's a part of the project that isn't really, uh, uh, that's turning on details of the physics and I'm, I'm uh, leaving it, we're leaving it to air in a bit to give us a, a, a more vivid sense of the lay of the land there. But, uh, so, I'll report back to you when, when that's done. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks a lot. So, you see another question? No, it's Professor John. Okay, if there are no other questions, I can thanks again to Professor Ocean. So, I think that's it. Been three interesting, somewhat challenging, but I hope very productive days. I would like to thank you, a lot of people who helped me 
doing this event. So, Professor Adilson, my colleague and friend, Professor Adilson, Diego Aleci de Rivera, who helped with the heart and the, and the Facebook page of the, uh, Renata. Uh, Os amigos, the friends of the Central de Eventos. Marcus, Mateus, Vinicius, Pamela. So it was a decent for maybe one of the few decent things that are probably the only one that in this horrid pandemic that is possible to have an event with 10 keynote speakers from all over the world. We have people from the and lots of uh, speakers from really all over the world. We have people from uh, South America, from North America, from Europe, from Asia. So thanks a lot for being here to all our uh, speakers and to the public as well. And hopefully this is the first event in uh, philosophy of the religion, like only on philosophy of religion at Unicinos, but hopefully not will be the last. I mean, we can show that there is a, an interest, a real interest in, uh, in the topic philosophy of religion as philosophy of religion, which is, as I was saying to some uh, of our international speakers is not even uh, considered as a independent subject in uh, here in Brazil. Like uh, if you work on philosophy religion here, you are literally working epistemology or metaphysics. And uh, you know we are showing that philosophy of religion is a philosophical subject. It's not theology. It's not uh, Christian apologetic, but it's an independent subject with arise a lot of interest with questions that involve of course, epistemology, science, and uh, metaphysics, and ethics, and uh, so. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, again for to all speakers and to the public. And hopefully, see you soon. We are planning already other events. So, Congress of the eyes. Thanks, Amara. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Well done. Yes. See ya. Okay, so good night or oh.